When we uh, first ever talked about DNA, the idea of it was, at the time, the way I talked about it was that it was like a long, long strip of code, roughly about uh, 4 billion characters long. And talked about it uh, a little more also, saying, well, uh, what's interesting about DNA also is that uh, because it is made up of four different uh, nucleotides, that I am basically dealing with a base four system. By that, I mean it's a number system that works in uh, powers of four. So, for example, when I say 321, what I mean by that is that I'm saying 1 times 10 to the 0 plus 2 times 10 to the 1 plus 3 times 10 to the 2. Because each column, we just instinctively know when we read numbers that each column is a one extra power, one extra power of the base number. In this case, we use a base this is base 10. So that's how we read numbers. But uh, computers, of course, use base 2. And that means that when I look at, say, I don't know, let me make something up, 1011. So that would be uh, base 2. So this would be 1 times 2 to the 0 plus 1 times 2 to the 1 plus 0, so I don't add anything there, plus uh, 1 times 2 to the power of, what is this, 2 to the power of 3, right? Because this, this column would be 2 to the power of 2. So what do I got here? What is this number equal to in base 10? Well, it's going to be 1 plus 1 times 2, so that's 2 plus 1, that's 3, and then plus 1 times 2 to the power of 3, that's 8. So this is actually equal to, that's really weird, <laughs> This is equal to 11 in base 10. I didn't realize I was going to make all these ones, but um, you get the idea. So what's interesting is that DNA is essentially a base 4 system. So I can have, uh, I can use the numbers 0, 1, 2, and 3, and every column will be basically 4 to the power of 0, 4 to the power of 1, 4 to the power of 2, 4 to the power of 3, on and on and so what you can see or perhaps you should try yourself sometime and just say okay so how many how many columns how many columns do I need to get a fairly big number let's say I wanted to do in base two uh, a number that's fairly big let's say somewhere in the 80s or 90s or something like that and you can figure it I want to, and I suggest that you even take a moment to pause and think okay how many different individual numbers are needed to write down a fairly large number. And then try to do the same with a base 4 system. Because this is 11. 11 requires 4 digits. Four, there's 4 digits here. 4 digits. Four. So if I was looking at this as a code, I would need 1, 2, 3, 4 codes just to say the number 11. Um, so the question is, what would be the same thing done with base 4. Well, let me see. Um, how many 4s do I need? Well, to get 11, let me see. I need, well, if I did 3 4s, I would need 12. So, so I can only get 2 4s, that's 8, and then I could get 3 1s. Oh, okay, so this, this 2 3, what looks like 23, but that's actually in base 4, that's equal to 11 in base 10, all right, this is base 4. But more importantly, compared to a computer, which uses binary, or rather base 2, that's also equal to 1011, which is base 2, which requires how many? 4. It requires 4 digits. And now I've suddenly dropped the number of, uh, the number of, num well, the number of numbers, the number of digits that I require down to two. I've halved the number of information required to get to say the same thing. So there's a certain, 
because DNA does actually use at the root of it, at the root of it, a system that's much more compact, you can get a lot more information than you would think because four billion, uh, four billion, a list of four billion in a code is quite a lot, even by a computer standard. That's, that's, that's a lot of information you can pack in there, but you can do an enormous amount more with the base four system. So there's something kind of beautiful about DNA in the way that it's been set up is that there's there's actually a really kind of clever bit of complexity to it just by the simple matter of using four different nucleotides to make its code. So is that all there is though? And that's what I really want to talk about. Is that all there is? Is it just simply a strip of code and then um, everything comes along and basically says, okay, I'm just going to read the code out. Because what we do know is that every single cell in your body has the same the same code, the same DNA. There is no difference between the DNA in one type of cell as another. Every single cell in your body has the same strip of DNA code. But there's, there's a bit of an issue. And I'm going to bring up two things that I think we need to discuss. And one is that, well, this is a neuron cell. This is a brain cell that you're looking at. Take a look at it. Get a good breathe it in that's what they look like and this is this is a liver cell liver cell brain cell liver cell brain cell and you immediately say shoot those don't look the same but they have the exact same dna in them so what we do know about uh human beings is that when they start forming uh as a zygote and then on and on into a fetus uh, the initial cells are all identical to each other. They're known as stem cells. You've probably heard that term before. And stem cells, well, change. They change, and, and at some point they become a brain cell, and, and they go to another part of the body, and they'll become a, a, a liver cell or a muscle cell or a bone cell, and they all look very, very different. So what we're talking about is that, yes, they have all the same DNA code, but not all of that DNA is being expressed. And what I'm talking about is the fact that we don't just have a long strip of code. We have a strip of code which has certain sections to it. So, for example, I could say, right, um, let me just check here. I'm going to change my brush size a little bit. Up a little. Oh, there we go. I feel better about that now. We could say from here to here is a certain type of gene for uh, liver cells. And, and maybe here... There's a little bit here, and that's for, um, let's say, brain cell, brain cell, right? And there won't be just one part. It's actually going to be, and this is what's really interesting, is that the gene for liver could be here, but there could be a little bit over here. This could also be for liver cells. Um, this could be for a muscle cell right here. In fact, uh, you could have, you know, a little section here that overlaps. Like, there's all sorts of sections to this whole thing. So what happens is that for some reason, we're only getting certain parts of our DNA on, turned on, and therefore showing what we call gene expression. But there's something even more than that. Because I'm only talking about that for some reason I have cells changing and whatnot. But there's a larger question at work here. Because what we want to ask ourselves is, okay, I've got this code. I've got a code that uh, says everything about me. But uh, does my, can my DNA change over time? Could what I do in life affect the DNA of, say, my children? Anybody in my lineage, if you will. My, my, uh, my biological lineage. Anybody... Uh, that I make. Does what I do, that's what I'm saying, what I do, my behavior during my life affect my DNA? And the answer is, uh, the answer is no, but sort of yes. Um, because it's a little more complicated than that. So we're sort of talking about two things. One is that, well, how, how do my cells change? How do things get altered? 
uh, from, say, a stem cell, which seems almost like a blank slate, and then suddenly knows when to turn on and off parts of it. But also, that implies that there's gene expression being turned on and off, and could my behavior also change that genetic expression? For example, you have uh, genes for brown eyes and blue eyes, perhaps. But only um, if you have brown eyes and blue eye genes, only one is being expressed. You don't have brown blue eyes. You've got either brown or you have either blue, which means some of your genetic expression, some of your genes are not being expressed. They're being suppressed. So how's that going on? How's that working? Um, so we're going to talk about that. And it all comes under a really fascinating topic known as epigenetics. And... Uh, this is this is an amazing topic. Uh, this is really amazing. And so I, I really want to get into it. And so in order to really understand it, we have to talk a little bit more about DNA, about how it's uh, wrapped up. Because here we have a picture of DNA really close up because we have the nucleotides. We have the little the little molecules that are connecting it on the edge, like the run, the sides of the ladder. It's all twisted up. But you may have uh, remembered that in our classes we've talked a lot about chromosomes and when we were talking about chromosomes we said yeah they're sort of like these bunched up bits of dna it's there's one strip of dna here there's another strip of dna here and and i got i got a bunch of these uh and then well 23 pairs and then this does not what what's going on here and so if i zoom in if i zoom in on a bit of the chromosome and look at it i will notice that it's made up of this kind of like even more bunched up bits of that it's like okay and then i go okay well zoom in zoom in even more zoom in even more and i'm going to notice that the dna is not alone the dna has actually been started to get twisted tightly and tightly due to the fact that there's other things there so i'm going to try to draw this properly but basically dna is coming along so this is one one strip of dna and then I'm going to draw something else here. And there's going to be a little something here. And I'm going to draw it with a little bit. It's going to have a little tail. What is this? What is this? What you're looking at is a protein. And uh, if you watched the video there on, uh, on uh, photosynthesis and you will notice that I, I mentioned proteins quite a bit. And proteins are basically molecules that have a very interesting geometry and shape to them that they can even act like little machines. And uh, this protein is no different. It has a special name, a fairly important one for how things work, and it's known as a histone. A histone. And a histone is basically, I, I think the easiest way of thinking about it is it's like a little barrel. I'm going to draw it in 3D here just to get a better idea. It's like a little, see a little barrel. It's a barrel with a, has um, little tails on it as well. And when you're making, when your strip of DNA has compressed, compacted into this very tightly wound chromosome shape, it's because the DNA has wrapped itself around these histones. And not only that, but there's actually, um, uh, the histones then start packing themselves, whoops, the histones start packing themselves into groups of four. So uh, what happens is that this will wrap, and then this will wrap around another one, and another one, and another one. And so you have DNA that is now going, wee, going around here, going around here, going around here. Should have drawn the tails too, sorry. And then I got the tails of the histones hanging out outside. And in fact, the histones themselves will start to wrap around each other, creating these really compact little shapes like this. So really what's happening is that I should draw this once again in 3D. Let me draw that there. Yeah. So the 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 DNA is coming in on one side, and then it's wrapping around, it's going around there, and then it comes around there, and then it comes around there, and then it comes out. And so it's all tightened up around these little barrels, these histones. And then we also have these little tails hanging off, because the tails are going to become a little important. So 
what, why am I bringing this up? Well, remember what we said here. We're talking about uh, the ability for a gene to be expressed. And there's a few ways that your DNA can be, or at least parts of your DNA can be suppressed or, uh, let me put this over here, suppressed or, or actually activated. So we're going to talk about um, two ways. There's actually three ways. Um, I'm not going to talk about uh, the third one. Uh, that's using uh, miRNA. Um, it's probably outside the scope of what we're trying to talk about here, but it is part of epigenetics. So I'm just going to I'm going to write it down here just so that you don't forget it. Number three, I haven't even done number one or number two, but number three is miRNA, which is another way that your uh, DNA can get uh, blocked or genes can be expressed or not expressed. But what we're going to talk about mainly is how histones and uh, straight up DNA uh, genetic expression can happen. And this is what's really interesting. Um, it's true. Your code does not change over your lifetime. Your code, when it's given to your child, will be a combination of you and the your partners or, or, or whoever's involved. And uh, then at that point, uh, that person's DNA, your, your the child's DNA will not change either. So... So, so where's the genetic expression coming in? So let's just take that away for a moment and take a look at this. So as I said, you have these gene areas. So let's just say that you have this for, um, let me see, we'll just say liver is here and liver is here. And maybe liver is th these two as well. I, like, I mean, I'm just simplifying here. But then... Um, say from here to here this is uh, for muscle and uh, this is muscle muscle and over here is muscle and that will have to be used but let's just so let's say I have uh, I'm not even going to talk about the histones yet I want you to keep that in the back of your mind but we're going to talk about method number one in which your genes get expressed so method number one is known as DNA methylation. So why is it called methylation? Well, methyl is a reference to a certain, a very specific little molecule. Methyl is uh, typically understood as a carbon that is attached to a hydrogen, another hydrogen, another hydrogen. Um, you will notice that when you talk about covalent bonding that carbon requires four. It requires uh, four bonds. So there's kind of this extra bond that's waiting to attach to things. So I'm just going to write this as uh, CH3. It's easier to write it that way, but you get the idea. It looks something like that. Well, not at 90 degrees to each other, but nah, it is essentially more like a pyramid. Not important right now. But what these things do is that when we have, uh, say, a stem cell, and it is going to be a liver cell. Well, what we have here is we have a bunch of tags. Now, this isn't the DNA. This is something that's been added to on top of the DNA. It's basically attached all over the place. There's a whole bunch of methyl groups attached let me just put one over there, I'll put one over here. In fact, I'm not even going to draw the CH3. You get the idea. I'm going to put one over here. I'm going to put one over here. And they're all over the place. So what happens is that if you have these things attached, they're actually acting as, a, uh, let's call it a switch. So acts like a switch on or off on or off so when I have let's say I have demethylated DNA demethylated DNA is another way of saying I have a stem cell so let's say I want to have a uh, muscle cell 
uh, a muscle cell I want and so I don't want liver so what I do or what your body does is that these tags suddenly go away so what happens is that anywhere where I have the methylation right I have the switch turned off so I've turned off all the genetic expression for liver cells I have the muscle cells on and so when the machines that come along your DNA collecting all the code, they're only picking up the code for muscle cells and therefore they build muscle cells. It would be the opposite if I was making liver cells, but the idea is that this methylation is basically a turning off switch. This is great for creating different types of body cells. Uh, I should mention, I've drawn it all over the place and there's a bit of a lie. There's a bit of a lie about where I've been placing them because it only attaches to one of the nucleotides cytosine remember there's there's adenine thymine cytosine and guanine or guanine depending on how you want to pronounce it but in this case dna methylation only attaches to one of the nucleotides and it's a specifically important one uh starts at many uh genetic uh, coding so a lot of genes start with cytosine anyway so it's a it's sort of a tag uh, knowing that we're going to start it off and so what we have here is a great little system that just allows you to have on off on off anything you need now remember this is not your DNA it's a tag added to the outside of your DNA so that's DNA methylation but what's what's interesting is that that's not the only way we do it do I have my histone still yay here's my histones because number two, yes, I knew these would come up, is histone, and I'm going to call it acetylation. Whoops. Histone acetylation. And in this case, I am adding something. Uh, um, uh, I guess I should bring this. Okay, let's just say I'm going to say it. It's going to, be, it's going to look something like that. Um what's known as a acetyl, uh, acetyl functional group. So I add this to, say, a histone's uh, tail. Now this is different. This is different. This is not a switch on or off. Now notice, now by the way, I added it here, but really what I should have done is I should have added it over here to when it's really, really tightly wound. Now when your histones are really tightly wound. Imagine I have a machine chugging along, and it is kind of a machine. Let's call this the machine, the code machine. The code machine that's reading your code. And it comes along, chugga, 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 chugga. And it comes across this big pile of histones. It would probably go, ah, forget that. And moves along and continues along the DNA. In other words, anything that's been wrapped up in your histones is not getting expressed because it's not accessible. So what is histone acetylation? It's just another tag. It's another tag, an, ac an acetyl, I guess is the better way of saying it, an acetyl group added to histones, and it doesn't act like a switch. It's, it's not a switch. I'm starting to get really messy here. I'm sorry. Well, it's a video. You can pause and look around. It is really a knob. And if I was going to use a... Um, and electricity, why not, right? We did we did circuits. It is a variable, it's a variable resistor. It acts like that instead. In other words, it's like a, um, a pot switch. Remember pot switches? That's where you could make um, a light bulb dim rather than just turn it on or off. You could turn the knob slowly and it would change your resistance slowly it's the same thing here so what's happening is that the acetyl group allows it to loosen up it loosens up loosens up and allows some of it to get whoops some of it to get expressed but it's not in the same way that dna methylation work which is strictly as an on off thing in this case it's more of a a slow change you, you can express some or most or all, and so there, there's a little more of a, um, what would be the word? Uh, finesse. A little more of a finesse to the whole thing. So this becomes a lot more useful. 
um, for for changing how much your genes get expressed or which ones get expressed. So what does this all mean? Um, these tags all along your DNA, these tags are all affecting your uh, your gen genetic expression. Now, as I pointed out, your DNA hasn't changed. It's just that there's other information added to your DNA in the form of these methyl groups and acetyl groups that are basically telling your coding machines what to actually express. So what does this mean? Well, we have found in, in basically the last 20 years something kind of interesting. And that's that we, we, we've kind of not gotten the full story about how we get uh, things passed on to, say, your children. Because these, these methyl groups, these acetyl groups, all these tags, these epigenetic tags, are affected by your behavior. And this stuff gets sent on, a lot of it gets sent on to your children uh, along with your DNA. So this, this, this leads to something kind of interesting. Because what we're saying here is that what you do in your life affects certain amounts of genetic expression. Let's, um, let's give an example. For, um, uh, a very good example would be like diabetes. Diabetes, um, sometimes diabetes is the result of diet of uh, how well you're taking care of yourself that can happen um, people who get um, very obese have a much more a larger propensity for get getting diabetes and you think okay yeah well that was just my life that's not going to affect my kids uh oh uh oh this is <laughs> new information come to light now is that actually no that's not true that's not true at all a lot of what we do changes this coding that's placed on top of the code. This tags, these epigenetic tags are affected by your behavior. Therefore, how you live your life is actually going to be affecting the life of your child. Eh, it puts a little more uh, responsibility on how you live your, <laughs> live your life if you plan on having kids. Um, so, for example, we could discuss things about does, for example, heavy drinking or smoking affect uh, the tags uh, the epigenetic tags and does that get transferred on to your child uh, does a incredibly lazy person then uh, change the tags that then get changed onto your child's tags this is what's so cool about this whole thing it's a new science it really is there's there's only so much information known now we know this is a brand new thing this is one hell of an opportunity for all of you this is stuff that is just you, you'd be getting in on the and on what would be the word getting in at the uh, front door. Oh, I don't even know what the expression is. You'd be getting in at the start. Uh, so I uh, yeah, if you're into biology, this is one of those interesting things to check out. Okay, I hope that was interesting to you. It's interesting to me. Bye.